That's always a rather hard act to follow. <laughs> In fact, I'm half tempted tonight to say, what more is there to be said? Good night. <laughs> but I think there's a few more things we can, uh, we can bring to it, but I really appreciate that discussion and uh, showing various aspects of it, and I think uh, that the folk that spoke on there all had uh, good points to make. So let's go a little deeper and uh, see where that takes us tonight. This is certainly a contemporary issue. I don't think it, we seriously ought to try avoiding it. Uh, for example, in Orlando, Florida, the home of Disney World and Mickey Mouse, there were sincere, dedicated Seventh-day Adventists, not related to the conference, but on their own, who uh, produced uh, gigantic billboards along the highway, uh, basically showing a picture of the Pope, you know, meet the Antichrist from your friends, the Seventh-day Adventists. And uh, this became a, a major crisis uh, in the southern part of the United States as to how to relate to this. And basically the conference said, well, this is not from us. You know, we didn't do it, and so forth. And uh, that this was done by some dissident people who have created problems in other areas before, so please don't paint us with the brush of these people. So there was some serious embarrassment on the part of the mainstream church at the presentation of these billboards. So the question is, did those billboards go too far? Bible readings for the home. Traditionally, uh, it's a book written uh, more than 100 years ago, has been sold by our literature evangelists for at least 100 years, uh, has been updated a little bit along the way, but not, uh, not too seriously changed. Oddly enough, a copy of Bible Readings for the Home fell into the hands of the chief editor of the Associated Press. In the United States, the Associated Press is the main clearinghouse for all the newspapers, TV, radio in North America. When the Associated Press puts out a press release, it gets pretty much into all the newscasts, all the newspapers, and so on around the country. After 100 years plus, Bible readings for the home is mailed in a mass mailing to the editor of the Associated Press and out comes a story nationwide blasting the bigotry of Seventh-day Adventists. Did Bible readings for the home go too far? Or was it a book that was more at home at another time in another place than it is today? I was one of four individuals that Elder Falkenberg, president of the General Conference at the time, asked to write a reply uh, to the Associated Press. Not that we each would write it, but the four of us would write it, and then uh, he and Bill Johnson would put together a single reply. And for some strange reason, I cannot find what I wrote there anymore. It's maybe on my computer somewhere, but I don't find it. But as I recall, basically I said something like this. And here we have a report on, on Adventists, what they have to say about the papacy. And, uh, you know, the national media is saying, this is shocking, this is disgusting. It's unbelievable that Christians would talk about each other in this way. It, it really hit the wrong spot. And basically what I said was this. I said, really, Seventh-day Adventists do not need to apologize for identif identifying historic failings of the papacy. For these very same failings were identified by Roman Catholics of very high standing in the church, such as Francis of Assisi, Eberhard of Salzburg, and others. In other words, in medieval times already, these very same abuses were being identified. We did not cook them up. Most Protestant churches in North America were founded in reaction to some of these abuses and so forth. However, we recognize that uh, everyone is allowed to change, everyone is allowed to grow up, everyone is allowed, and, and recently the Pope has repudiated many of these publicly and says, yes, we went too far. And so I would ask that you would allow us to hold fellow Christians accountable to their highest ideals, at the same time 
you should expect from us that we would be as welcoming of criticism and accountability from you. And, see, and I think in today's age, that is bottom line. If you are free to criticize others, you need to be able to take it yourself. Bit of an Australian attitude, perhaps. But uh, <laughs> if you're going to dish it out, you better be prepared to take some. Okay? And, uh, you know, I think that's, that was the recommendation I gave to Elder Falkenberg. I did not see the, uh, the actual thing that they, they sent in and so forth, so I don't know how much of my... Uh, suggestions were done. But it seems to me that in today's world, the idea perhaps of mutual accountability, uh, after all, are we as Seventh day Adventists totally free of any of the abuses of, of authority, abuses of government, uh, perhaps going too far at times in, in, in the way we carry certain teachings of the Bible? So is it possible? That, uh, that we are totally guilt-free in these areas? Or could other Christians, as some of our Lutheran friends attempted to do a few years ago, call attention to some areas where we perhaps haven't been as forthright, haven't been as clear as we could have been? Uh, I, in today's world, it seemed to me that we didn't need to apologize for things that have been said by many people through the ages and I think are historical facts. Okay? We don't need to apologize for that. At the same time, we need to recognize that we are not perfect either and invite those who feel stung by our criticisms to in investigate us just as well and uh, let's, uh, let's learn from each other. Certainly, the papacy was front row center in the NET series, particularly NET 98. My friend Dwight Nelson, uh, pastor of the church where my daughter uh, oldest daughter is a member and where uh, the family is kind of toying with the idea of, of joining there as a group so we can all sit together again. Uh, <laughs> you know how it is. If the teenagers want you to come to their church, I think it's good that they're going to church and we ought to go to their church. That's sort of where my wife and I are pondering now. So he would become my pastor. But uh, Dwight Nelson in his Net 98 series, I, I was fascinated by this because as I was a young man attending evangelistic series and then doing some myself, uh, it seemed to me that Mark of the Beast was sort of a one-time thing that uh, was there to sort of encourage people to commit to the Sabbath. You know, they may be convinced about the Sabbath, but to commit to it, say, you know, you don't want to hang on and, uh, and end up with the Mark of the Beast. So sort of a one-out one thing out of 25 or 30 meetings. In the Net 98 series, fully one-third of the meetings seemed to highlight that. And that, to me, was a surprise and a bit of a concern. Was, was that maybe going too far? And Pastor Nelson and I have vigorous discussions on many issues. Really good guy. And uh, I really, really treasure him as, as a friend and a human being. But uh, we're, we're wrestling with these things together. We were surprised in talking to the Lutherans how offended they were by the mark of the beast. Not uh, thinking so much that they were involved in that, but to say, you know, we don't know that, the, we don't feel like this is an appropriate way for Christians to deal with each other. So, in, in a number of different ways, the church has been challenged in recent years have we gone too far? Not so much, as maybe was implied in the video, not so much has our teaching, you know, is, is our teaching inaccurate, although we will take a look at that tonight also. But the question is, in our application of it, is, have we gone too far? Is this the best way to approach the issue in today's world? Is it central to Adventist identity to be against Catholics? Do you have to really talk strong against Catholics to be a Seventh-day Adventist. Some appear to feel so. Is that going too far? And it's an Adventist concern as well. Particularly our young people are increasingly uncomfortable with the whole idea of bashing other religions in today's world. After all, young people growing up in today's world realize that the real divide today is not between Catholic and Protestant, is not between Christian and Muslim, although many people believe it is. But our young people feel 
The real divide in today's world is between believer and unbeliever. And that in that world, somebody who believes in Jesus seems like an ally rather than an enemy, even if you disagree on some points of doctrine. And I find with our youth, we can very quickly lose them sometimes by the way that we speak about other Christians. They themselves feel at times that we have gone too far. Have we? Let's go to Revelation 13. Let's first of all ask, is it biblical? Is it biblical to teach that the medieval papacy was in fact the beast of Revelation 13, was in fact the Antichrist and so on, and will perhaps one day come back again to do the same kind of deadly work? Is that appropriate? To Revelation 13. Let's begin with Revelation 12, 17. The dragon was angry with the woman and he went away to make war with the remnant of her seed, those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Once again, you see, there are two basic uh, opponents in the final battle of earth's history. You have the dragon on one side you have the remnant on the other. As we illustrate here, the dragon against the remnant. That's the two sides in the final conflict of Earth's history. As you may remember from previous presentations, we've been taking a look at Revelation 12, Revelation 13, Revelation 14. Revelation 13 in particular fleshes out the dragon side of the battle. Revelation 14, on the other hand, uh, brings further detail to the remnant side of the conflict. And by the way, tomorrow we will focus on Revelation 14 and we will ask the question, is the Sabbath truly the issue in the final crisis? Is that a fundamental teaching of the book of Revelation or is it something that Adventists believe because Ellen White said so, as some suggest? Tonight, however, we focus on Revelation 13, the uh, rise, the character of the sea beast and the land beast. Revelation 13 has two stages of history. Do you remember last night that we talked about three stages of history in Revelation 12? We had the time of Jesus and his disciples. We had the time of the end, you know, the final battle with the remnant. And then in between... In between those two stages was an intervening period of 1260 days of a woman out in the wilderness, the dragon attacking the woman in the wilderness, and so on. Revelation 13 seems to have two stages of history in it, and these are signaled by the Greek tenses. And if you've never heard this before, what I'm about to say, that shouldn't be a surprise because this was a discovery that I made reading the Greek text of Revelation 13 uh, some uh, five, six years ago. And uh, shared this in a number of places and uh, it is recognizably sound, I believe. The aorist tense in the Greek, mentioned it a few times in past meetings, the aorist tense is a point in past time. So when in the Greek language you do a verb, in the aorist tense, that verb is past from the standpoint of the one speaking the sentence or writing the sentence. It's past tense. On the other hand, present and future tenses, as they sound, uh, they function now or uh, in the future. Now here's the interesting thing. In Revelation 13, you have a shift in the tenses between past, aorist tense on the one hand, and present and future tenses on the other hand. Now what would be the function of these time elements in Revelation 13? As we noticed earlier, remember those three rectangles there? Revelation 13 is fleshing out the dragon's war against the remnant. All right? The dragon is planning to attack the remnant. Revelation 13 elaborates on that, all right? So if there's material in the past tense in Revelation 13, would that be before or after the dragon's final attack? It would be before, 
right? Past tense would be before the time of Revelation 12. All right? Present tense would be part of that battle. Future tense would be something afterward. Okay? In Revelation 13, there are things that occur in the past, present, and future in relation to 1217. Now, is that going too fast? Let me see. Maybe I think the pictures may help. All right? Revelation 13 contains material that is both before and during the context of Revelation 12, 17. What is Revelation 12, 17? The dragon's angry with the woman and goes about to make war with the remnant of her seed. All right? There are things that happen before then, and they are signaled in the past tense. So let's take a look at those past tenses, or look at the tenses in Revelation 13. Revelation 13, 1 to 7, all of the main verbs are aorist tense. Revelation 13, 8 through 10, they move to present and future tenses. Revelation 13, 11 goes back to the aorist tense. Now, by the way, what happens in Revelation 13, 11? Those of you who are really familiar with this text, that's where the land beast comes up. In verse 1, the sea beast comes out of the sea. In verse 11, the land beast comes up out of the earth, and it goes to aorist tense, but then in 12 through 18, present and future tenses. Now, here's the interesting thing. Here's what fascinated me about the discovery I made. Uriah Smith, in his teaching on Revelation 13, and great controversy as well, suggests that some parts of Revelation 13 occurred in the Middle Ages and other parts at the end of time. It's just asserted in those books. You know what I found out? Everything that Ellen White felt happened in the Middle Ages is an aorist tense in Revelation 13. And everything that she talked about as in the future is in present or future tense. In other words, within Revelation 13 itself is an indication of when you're dealing with the Middle Ages and when you're dealing with the end of time. That distinction is already there in the text. Whether or not it's there in translation, it is there in the original language. So that's the significance of this. When you get the beast coming up out of the sea, the beast is described in past tense. This is talking about the origin of that beast, its background and history. Then it describes the action at the time of the vision. When the beast from the earth comes up, once again, you go back to the past because the rise of that land beast is before the time of the end. So you have two beasts coming up that were in existence before the end, but both of them are going to act at the time of the end. Who are these guys? Fasten your seatbelt, stay tuned. All right, so two beasts of Revelation 13. One is from the sea, the other is from the earth. Each is first introduced with a visual description in the aorist tense. All right, well, if you're watching a movie or a cartoon, when a character first appears, you study them carefully, don't you? You want to see what they look like and how they behave and get to know their character. Uh, that's called characterization. In any movie, if you're introducing a character in the movie, you want those early appearances to sort of give the audience the clue of what kind of person this is. If you want to play with the audience, you make the bad guys really nice and the good guys really unpleasant at the beginning, see? And you got the whole audience set up for the big reversal when the good guys become the bad guys and the bad guys become the good guys. Now, usually movies are not that devious. But I had been thinking sometime, wouldn't it be cool if somebody would create a movie about the end times from the Adventist perspective and the end time deception? You know, and you could set up all the bad guys as being really great, you know, and then little by little as the movie goes on, they, little things show up that you begin to wonder about them. And then in the end, you discover who the bad guys really are and then prepare the audience for the end time deception. Well, I don't have the money or the talent to do that, so I'll leave that up to you. All right. Anyway. So each of these characters that shows up is introduced first with a visual description. You go to the text, you can see this. They're described uh, in their coming up. 
actions prior to the final battle. So these are two characters who will play a role in the final battle, but when they first appear in the text, you're told what they were like before the final battle. So you get sort of a characterization taking place. And the characterization in Revelation is not deceptive. They're ugly when they start, and they're ugly when they finish. You know who the good guys and the bad guys are in the book of Revelation. There's really little doubt most of the time. The present and future tenses then show the actions of each beast during the final battle of earth's history. So you have two stages of history in Revelation 13. The time before the end, when both of these characters exist and do certain things, and then the time of the final battle itself, when these characters are working together to accomplish their tasks. All right? This follows a pattern in the book of Revelation. Every time in the book of Revelation a new character appears, a time of identification or characterization occurs. Revelation 1, 12 to 18 is the first appearance of Jesus. And what happens when Jesus appears? You get a detailed description. What his eyes look like, what his legs look like, how he's dressed, and so forth. All right? So when Jesus first appears, you get a detailed description of him, and then Jesus acts. In chapters 2 and 3, he acts in the context of the vision. So introduction, description, then the character acts in the course of the vision. Two witnesses of Revelation 11. Uh, first of all, they're introduced. You look at them, you see what they look like, you see their behaviors in past tense, kind of before the time of the vision. And then, beginning with verse 7, the two witnesses act in the course of the vision. So you see this is a pattern that's common through the book of Revelation. Sea beast, of course, appears, and in aorist tense, you get a characterization of the sea beast, and then the sea beast acts. Verse 8, verses 12 through 18, sea beast acts in the final crisis. Land beast introduced in verse 11, very short introduction. Maybe because the land beast has a very short history, perhaps, okay? 13, 11, and then working together with the sea beast in verses 12 through 18, the land beast continues. You see this principle here? Past tense, characterization, stage, the first stage of history in chapter 13, and then actions at the time of the vision, present and future tenses. These are the, uh, the vision itself, the second stage within chapter 13. So here we see Revelation 12. Remember there were three stages of history in Revelation 12. The first stage doesn't appear in Revelation 13. Uh, pictures of Jesus uh, in his incarnation, in his ascension to heaven, in his seating on the throne of God, stuff from the time of Jesus and his disciples, it's not there in chapter 13. It's missing. What is there in chapter 13 Parallel stages 2 and 3. For example, you have 1260 days in Revelation 12, 42 months in Revelation 13. The earth helps the woman in 1216, you have a beast from the earth in 1311. So the material that in Revelation 13 was in past tense matches up nicely with the middle part of chapter 12. Can you see that? I, I may be overemphasizing this, but I realize for those who aren't super familiar with these texts, uh, some of this may be going by pretty fast. So Revelation 13, all that material that's in the past fits beautifully into the middle period of Revelation 12. So you see how Revelation kind of builds layer on layer uh, in its interpretations. Then finally, you have the dragon against the remnant. And in Revelation 13, you have worldwide worship of the beast and so on. And we'll flesh this out a little bit more uh, later on tonight. So here you see Revelation 13 has two stages of history, just as Revelation 12 had three. And Revelation 13 covers the last two stages of Revelation 12. It's an elaboration of the last part of uh, Revelation 12. 
So there's a parallelism between these that helps to clarify them. So the aorist or past tense portions of Revelation 13 revisit the second stage of Christian history that we looked at last night. Let's take a look at the text. Revelation 13, 1 and 2. I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. He had ten horns and seven heads. And upon his horns there were ten crowns. And upon his heads, names of blasphemy. The beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like a bear, and his mouth was like a mouth of a lion. What do you notice about all these verbs that are in purple here? Past tense. You see, past tense, on and on and on, past tense. This is the introduction to the beast. Do you notice how it's a visual description? I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. Now, if you were to see an animal coming up out of the sea, what's the first thing you would see? The ears, unless it has horns. So the first thing you see, he had ten horns. And what's the next thing? Seven heads. And upon his horns, ten crowns. And on his heads, names of blasphemy. The beast I saw was like a leopard, and then the feet were like a bear, And then the mouth was like a lion. So you see first the horns, then the heads, then the body, then the feet. And then the mouth comes into play. Apparently the beast wasn't talking underwater. But once it gets up out of the water, then the mouth starts working. Okay? Kind of like a lot of people. You know, mouth is working whenever you're up for air. All right. I like noisy people. They're like me. All right, so here you see the description of this sea beast. Well, now look at the red material here. And I appreciate the, uh, the quality of this projector. We had some problems a week ago, but look at, look at how good it is. The people are doing a great job back there. Just tell them thank you when you get a chance. All right, this is so clear and so helpful uh, to have, have this this way. All right, I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. He had ten horns, seven heads, leopard, lion, Bear should be red too and so on. Where does all that stuff come from? Daniel 7. If you go to Daniel chapter 7, what do you see? A lion, a bear, a leopard, a strange beast with ten horns and a little horn and so forth. When you look at Revelation 13, you see that there are so many details of Revelation 13 that are built on Daniel 7. So the beast of Revelation 13 is based on Daniel 7. And in Daniel 7, you had a whole series of beasts, and all of those are combined into one. You know, uh, kids talk about morphing these days. You know, and they used to have these toys that would change from a car into a robot and stuff like that. Well, here you have a whole bunch of different characters in Daniel 7, and they're all kind of morphed together into one. So this beast in Revelation 13 has a pedigree. Its pedigree is all of those characters in Daniel 7. So there's aspects of each of those characters in Daniel 7 in Revelation 13, in the sea beast. So the image of the sea beast is rooted in the vision of great world powers of Daniel 7. Whoever the sea beast is, it's rooted in Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, and the powers that follow. The sea beast dominates the world for a time, according to Revelation 13, 2, and then it goes into obscurity for a time. Revelation 13, it talks about a deadly wound. Do you remember that text? A deadly wound, and then the wound is healed. So whoever this beast is, it starts out, you know, pretty snippy, and then kind of fades off the scene, and then comes back. So that's a feature that we want to keep in mind. Revelation 13, 3. One of its heads was, as it were, wounded to death, and the wound of its death was healed, and the whole earth was impressed by the beast. So the dragon of Revelation 12 that we saw yesterday seems to represent Herod, the time of the fourth beast of Daniel 7. 
the pagan Roman Empire. Do you remember there's a dragon that comes down and that dragon in chapter 12 tries to destroy who? The male child that represents Jesus Christ. Scholars are pretty united on that uh, from whatever background they may come. Uh, they, they feel that that's pretty accurate there. So if the dragon of Revelation 12 represents Herod, the time of the fourth beast of Daniel 7, the pagan Roman Empire, this sea beast comes up when? Before or after Herod? Afterward. The dragon's already there, and the dragon hands over his power to the sea beast. In Daniel 7, the ten horns represent the period following the breakup of the Roman Empire. If you go back to Daniel 7, the beast that we recognize to be pagan Rome sprouts ten horns. That's later, according to the text. The ten horns come after the main beast. Now we have Revelation 13, a beast with ten horns. What's the significance? Notice the shift. The dragon of Revelation 12 has seven heads and ten horns, right? But where are the crowns? They're on the heads of the dragon. All right. Now, it was the beast of Daniel that represents the Roman Empire. Now watch this. You go to the sea beast and the crowns shift from the heads to the horns. See, in Revelation 13, the emphasis is that the crowns are on the horns, not on the heads as with the dragon. You have moved from the time of Rome, pagan Rome, to a later period when those ten horns would be in play. So the sea beast of Revelation comes on the scene after the dragon, after that fourth beast of Daniel. And so in the point of history, the sea beast, whoever it is, you've got to identify as coming on the scene after the Roman Empire. So here's the history of the sea beast. Its ancestry is the chain of powers from Babylon to Rome, Daniel 7. It rises after the fall of the Roman Empire, the time of the shift from heads to horns in Daniel. So it comes after the fall of the Roman Empire, 3. Its early history is parallel to the little horn power of Daniel 7. All right, so if you follow Daniel 7, you've got a series of empires followed by ten kingdoms, followed by a little horn that talks religious talk and blasphemes against God and changes times and laws and so on. Revelation 13 clearly has Daniel 7 in mind. And you can go to some Roman Catholic scholars to see that connection. That's not uh, real. You can't really miss it if you're carefully looking at Revelation, the original languages. Then there's a period of obscurity. So the sea beast arises after the Roman Empire, goes into obscurity for a time, loses some of its power, and then is resurrected to action by the dragon in the final conflict. So whoever this sea beast is, it plays a huge role at one point in history, sometime after the Roman Empire. It kind of fades off the scene for a while and then makes a comeback in the final crisis of Earth's history. So that's the history of the sea beast according to the text. Some characteristics of the sea beast, some of its qualities. First of all, it's a religious power. A religious power. It has a mouth speaking great things, even blasphemies. And blasphemy is religious talk. Okay, you're either for God or against him, but you're talking about him when you blaspheme. Blasphemy against God, the temple in heaven, and the saints, making war with the saints. So the sea beast is a religious power. That's one of its characteristics. Not only that, it persecutes the true people of God. So we will find it as a power, a major power, that persecutes the true people of God. And finally, it offers a rival gospel to that of the three angels. Where did I come up with that? Let's have a look. A rival gospel. In other words, it's not Islam. It's not Buddhism. It's not some religion that really doesn't relate directly 
to the Christian gospel. This is offering a rival gospel. Check this out. It says that the sea beast has authority over every tribe and people and language and nation was given to him. Well, what's the significance of that? Look at this. Revelation 14, 6. The three angels have what? The everlasting gospel to preach to those living on the earth, even every nation and tribe and language and people. Take a look at that. Who does the sea beast have authority over? The very people to whom the gospel is being preached. In Revelation 14, 6. Do you remember a week ago, last Sabbath, I was talking about the end time deception? The sea beast is nothing other than a counterfeit of Jesus Christ. It mimics his death and resurrection. It mimics his earthly ministry of 42 months. So the sea beast is a Christian power, whatever it is. It has a counterfeit gospel, a rival gospel to the true gospel that the author of Revelation was promoting. Over the last 2,000 years, I have to honestly say, if the Roman papacy is not what this text is all about, I don't know what it is. All right? So if somebody asks the question, have we gone too far identifying the beast of Revelation 13 with the papacy, I'd have to say no. We haven't gone too far in making that identification in the text. Because if the text has been rightly understood, if all of these pieces of evidence coming together make sense, then it's got to be a power that uh, has you know, come up after the time of the Roman Empire, is a power that persecutes the people of God, persecutes Christians, and no power has uh, martyred more Christians throughout the ages than, than the uh, Roman papacy, particularly in the Middle Ages. Uh, I think historical evidence numbers somewhere between 50 and 150 million people. That far exceeds the martyrdoms of Nazi Germany, for example. Uh, so we're dealing with something. If this is not the Roman papacy, I don't know what it is because it meets the specifications, the only power that meets all the specifications of this passage. So if you ask me, is that identification a sound one biblically? I'd have to say, yes, it is. So then what? Where do we go from there? That's a question we'll answer in a minute. But first, let's look at this second beast of Revelation 13:11. Since I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. Let's look at the pedigree of the land beast. It has a rather short one. All right, the, the, the sea beast has a long pedigree going back through the corridors of history through a whole series of empires. The land beast has a very short pedigree, just one verse. And it doesn't have an ancient pedigree. It doesn't tie in with anything in the Old Testament. There's no Old Testament power that uh, relates to this land beast. It's something new. It comes up from the earth. And by the way, in the book of Revelation, whenever earth is contrasted with sea, sea is bad and earth is good. All right? For example, the, uh, the uh, two witnesses are related to the earth. and Those are good powers. In chapter 12... Of Revelation, the earth helps the woman of the people of God. When earth is contrasted with sea, earth is good. When earth is contrasted with heaven, earth is bad. So earth is one of those symbols in Revelation that kind of looks both ways, depending on what it's contrasted with. What is earth here contrasted with, sea or heaven? With sea, because you have the beast from the sea, and the beast from the earth. That very contrast suggests that this is a much more positive power, whatever it is, than the previous one. It has no ancient pedigree. It comes up from the earth. There's horns like a lamb, and eventually it speaks like a dragon. The coming up from the earth reminds us of Revelation 12 when the earth helped the woman. So we have a fairly positive image here. Earth, in contrast with sea, 
is positive. It's a time of helping of the people of God. Has horns like a lamb. Every other time in the book of Revelation, there's 28 times in Revelation the lamb applies to Jesus Christ. The 29th time, it applies to the sea beast. So it's a positive image. It's like a lamb. There's something Christ-like about this beast, but it eventually speaks like a dragon. So this beast is positive in its opening, but then eventually becomes allied with the dragon. This is not a natural ally of the dragon, but it becomes an ally of the dragon. Now, persecuting powers come in two types in the course of history. You have religious persecutors, and you have political or anti-religious persecutors. With religious persecutors, you have an unhealthy bond between church and state. An unhealthy bond between church and state. For example, in ancient Babylon, the religion of Nebuchadnezzar, the golden statue, and the state of Babylon were the same thing. You worship Nebuchadnezzar, you know, Nebuchadnezzar's your governor and he's also your god at the same time. There's an unhealthy relationship there. In Rome, the same thing happened. Once the emperors began to be worshipped, the political power of the state and the religious authority became one. And that's an unhealthy situation when it happens. Happened also in the Middle Ages, uh, as we're well aware. On the other hand, the second type of persecution is hostility state to religion. And a couple of recent examples are revolutionary France and the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union, Adventists, Baptists, Catholics, Muslims were all in the same bed because they all had a common enemy. You see? They were all together uh, battling this anti-religious power. Jews, of course, uh, should be associated there too. So you have two basic types of persecuting powers in the course of history. This is one reason why there's a great debate today over religious liberty. Is the greatest threat to religion in the United States today is the question. Is the greatest threat religion against religion? Or is the greatest threat the secular state that is hostile to religion? You've heard some, uh, some other lectures this week on some of these subjects, but James Dobson and, and, and uh, Christian Coalition, they believe that the greatest threat to religion is number two, the hostility of the state to religion. Adventists believe the greatest threat is on the religious side of that spectrum, that one day people like the Christian coalition may take over the government, create that unhealthy bond, and thereby those who don't go along will be in trouble. The scenario of great controversy, of course, is that number one is the greater danger. Ellen White never mentions communism, uh, even though that was, that was growing in influence and power around the time before she died. She never makes mention of it. She does mention uh, the French Revolution would have certain powerful impacts yet in the future, and the Russian uh, communism kind of grew out of that to some degree. But she doesn't make much of that. She really sees number one as the crucial thing. Now that's the interesting thing. This land beast doesn't seem to fit either of those categories. It's a power that exercises a gentle and tolerant authority over its people. The lamb that roared. Yeah, doesn't make much sense, does it? Um, just uh, yesterday, my wife and I had the opportunity to go visit Hobbiton, uh, one of your little tourist traps uh, here in New Zealand. And uh, it was a sheep farm. And apparently 12,000 sheep there, you know, at the place where, where, that, where the movie set was for Lord of the Rings and so on. And uh, there were at least uh, 7,000 sheep piles that we gingerly walked around and hopefully didn't track too many back to the camp uh, when we returned and so forth. But just looking at those lambs, you know, you're not afraid of them. I've been afraid of animals before. I remember going to Africa once and... Um, we went to, uh, to sort of a, an animal park where they were rescuing uh, wounded animals from Kruger, which is right next door, Kruger National Park in, in South Africa. 
Uh, they were rescuing animals that were wounded, so I'm bringing them here for rehabilitation. And in some cases, you can even go in the cages and pet them and, and so forth. It was kind of a nice experience. Well, um, this particular one was not a petting cage. It had a fence about 20 feet high. And behind there was an old toothless lion, an old toothless lion. And he was kind of tired and uh, sort of staggered over toward the fence. And I had a little digital camera, and I, I got that little lens. I put it, you know how the, the chain link fence there? I got, kind of got that lens right through so I get a clean picture. And the lion was about three feet away from me, you know. And I, I'm looking through the camera like this, and all of a sudden I saw the wickedest look <laughs> in that lion's eyes. You know, it, it struck fear in my heart. The character lunged at the camera. <laughs> slammed into that fence, knocked me back about a meter, and then began to roar like you've never heard before. And then, horror of horrors, began gnawing on the fence. And I could see the metal things kind of bend and beginning to come together, you know. And this roaring is going on. And the only thing I could think of that moment was Jurassic Park. <laughs> you know, I was thinking, this is going to rip this fence down and I'm dead meat, you know. I'll tell you, that was a fearsome sight. The lamb that roared, uh-uh, doesn't scare me a bit. There were lambs all over the place yesterday. And I, I wasn't the least bit afraid. No fences between. There were hundreds of them. Could you imagine them all ganging up on me? That would be scary. <laughs> but they don't do that, you see. Now, the, the symbols of Revelation are there for a reason. There are lions there because, you know, you're supposed to be afraid. There are horrific beasts with horns and everything because you're supposed to be scared. But the lamb? No. That's gentle. That's tolerant. It's easy to get along with, you see, as long as you keep your feet in the right place. So, but all that changes when the lamb turns into a dragon. So whoever this power is, it's going to change character at some point in history. Who is the land beast? Has no ancient pedigree. It's a relatively positive power in its impact on history. It's related to the time of helping in Revelation 12, toward the end of the 1260 days, which if we've rightly understood that, ends sort of around the year 1800, if, if that's around the time when this land beast comes into being, that's not too, too far back. Earth may imply that uh, this is away from populated areas. That's a possibility. So toward the close of the 1260 days, around the time of the Reformation, the Enlightenment, the American Revolution, arises a new power that will one day terrify the world. Twenty years ago, no one would have believed me if I'd suggested that maybe, just maybe, this could be the United States of America. Today, I think you'd have quite a few takers on that, wouldn't you? Especially in Europe. Uh, it's amazing how much they dislike Bush in Europe these days. And uh, that's the thing. But you have to recognize with the fact whether the United States likes it or not, it's my country, okay? So I'm, you know, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to think like a Christian here and not think like an American. When you take a look at whether America wants to or not, the very nature of the battle against terrorism is an empire-building process. It requires America to intrude into the affairs, the inner affairs of dozens of nations around the world regarding intelligence, regarding who, which of the people are safe and which are not safe. You see, the very nature of this battle is different than any other, is requiring America to take on trappings of empire that it never held before and never wanted before. It's a very uneasy time, regardless of what political background you may be as an American. It's an uneasy time wrestling with the implications of what is going on today. No power in history would seem to fit the specifications here better than the United States of America. So here is sort of looking at the whole picture in a nutshell. 
You have Revelation 12, 17 that introduces the final battle and the present tenses of Revelation 13 relate to that final battle. You have material that occurs in the past and material that even goes beyond that final battle. So in the past, you have the rise of the sea beast, the 42-month period, the death and the resurrection, the persecution of the saints, the rise of the land beast, the looking like the lamb, the speaking like the dragon. All of these are in the past tense. All of these are before the end. Middle Ages, if you wish, rise of America, if you wish, and so forth. What occurs in the final battle itself? The sea beast works through the land beast, but behind the scenes. Behind the scenes. And this is one thing that may surprise some Seventh-day Adventists. You know, Adventists are looking to see the papacy sort of dominate the world. It may not be that way. Because according to the text, the sea beast is behind the scenes. It's the land beast that's out front making all the noise. So it might be, if you're looking for certain developments, it might not be quite that way. You need to be very careful as we watch the text. The sea beast works through the land beast, which exercises the authority of the sea beast in its place, in its behalf. So the really out front power will be the land beast. Performs great signs, like uh, bringing uh, cruise missiles down from heaven. I don't know. But it performs great signs deceiving those who live on the earth. And what is the final outcome? Everyone will worship the beast, makes an image to the beast, causes the image to speak, forces all to worship, offers the mark of the beast. So the final outcome of the battle is listed there. Final events. The present and future tense parts of Revelation 13. Six items here. Worldwide worship of the sea beast, verse 8. Persecution of the saints, verses 9 and 10. A coercive alliance between the sea and land beasts, verse 12. Deceptive miracles, verses 13 and 14. Setting up an image to the beast as an object of worship, verse 15. Supported by a death decree and economic boycott, verses 16 and 17. Those are the final events of the battle according to Revelation 13, the present and future tenses of the text. So here's a summary of how Adventists understand these things in Revelation 13. Number one, Revelation 13 is the dragon's attempt to gather two major allies to his support in the final battle. That's what Revelation 13 is about. He's looking for help. The dragon keeps attacking and attacking and keeps failing in chapter 12. So when the final battle comes, he says, I want to get all the support I can. So he gathers major allies in his support to the final battle. Two, the sea beast is the end time reincarnation of the papacy of the Middle Ages. The end time reincarnation of the papacy of the Middle Ages. In terms of revelation, is that specifically the pope? It may be bigger than that. Because... The Babylon of Revelation has three parts. It actually includes the dragon, the sea beast, and the land beast. All of those are Babylon. If you look at Revelation 16, 13, and 19, uh, you will see that clearly. We don't have time for that, uh, to go through that material here. But uh, the sea beast is the end time reincarnation of the papacy of the Middle Ages. In other words, a power that acts like the papacy certainly uh, with the papacy being part of it, no doubt, uh, will function in that way. Three, the land beast is something new, a major political religious power, probably the USA. Number four, USA dominates the world as the papacy once did. And five, the enemies of God's people are the very ones once thought as allies. After all, the papacy looks a lot like Jesus Christ in Revelation 13. After all, the United States was helping the woman during that time of persecution, where it was freeing and saving the saints. So the very, this is the reversal. This is where the Adventist message kind of goes against the grain. As the very people that most people would think are the greatest allies of Christian faith become in the end 
the ones that are its greatest enemies. And that's the part that may be difficult to get across in today's world. So, what do we do with this information? If our understanding of prophecy is essentially correct, what do we do with that information? First of all, I would point out it's not one of the 27 fundamental beliefs. You didn't know that. As big a role as it plays in our evangelistic meetings, you'd be certain to have at least three or four of our fundamental beliefs would involve that. It is not a fundamental belief. In other words, hating Catholics is not fundamental to Adventism. And I think we need to make that clear. Bashing systems of religion is not fundamental to Adventism. All right? So if you felt compelled that you had to say some things that you weren't comfortable in saying simply to be a good Adventist, it's not in the fundamental beliefs. Now maybe you think it should be. And that's something to take up with the powers that be. But the fundamental beliefs are those that we as a body have voted to, uh, to function in certain ways. So it's not a fundamental belief. That means that uh, whether or not you make it central in a particular course of meetings is a decision that is best made by those in that place as to whether this is helpful or not so helpful. We should be aware that in today's world, the kind of meetings that we're talking about here has a tendency to cause honest seekers to look elsewhere. And one of the things I plan to challenge the evangelists in a couple weeks on are this. Please, please, guys, survey the people that come to one meeting sometime. The people who come to one meeting and never come back. Why didn't they stay? What was it that turned them off? You see, I think we need to know more about that because in my experience with evangelism, the majority of people who attend the meetings come only one time. That means you're losing more than half your audience on the very first try. Why? I think we need to know that. I suspect that many, many honest seekers hearing the tone fear that this is not going to lead them closer to Jesus Christ. It's not going to lead them closer to God. So we need to be aware when we choose to share these things and the way that we choose them to, to share them are crucial because honest seekers, honest seekers, I'm not talking about people whose minds were made up before, but people who are really seeking something better can come to the meeting and come away saying, it's not here. What I was looking for, I'm not going to find it here. And that's tragic. That's sad whenever it happens. Know your audience. The first step of evangelism is listening. The very first step is listening. If you want to reach your community, the first thing to do is listen. Get to know that community. Get to know the leaders of that community. Get to know what the people think, what makes them tick, what needs they have. I remember uh, it was in Buchanan, Michigan. We uh, did a community survey. No, I want to tell you a different story. South Bronx. You've heard of South Bronx? They did a movie about it. It was called Fort Apache. It was about the gang wars and all that kind of stuff. I didn't see it. It was an ugly movie, but I'm aware of the title. You see, Fort Apache. South Bronx, very rough place. We went down there and did a survey. And as you go down the street, you had whole buildings that were just shells. The glass was all broken out. Nobody was living there. Or maybe a couple of families were living there that couldn't afford to pay rent. They were essentially homeless people moving into these shells. And then there were other buildings that were inhabited, but in between were empty lots full of broken glass and garbage strewn everywhere and children obviously not cared for and so forth. And we went down the street and surveyed that community, asking the people questions. And interestingly, this was fascinating, one of the questions was, are you happy with the condition of this neighborhood? Do you feel like this is a good and safe place? 100% of the people said, no, we think this needs changes. The next question was, if somebody would take the lead in cleaning up this block, would you help? You know how many said yes? 90% in this poverty-ridden, broken-down, crime-infested neighborhood, 90%. If somebody would stand up and take the lead and do something, 
I would help. I would be part of an army that would go and take over this place, take it away from the criminal elements and make it a nice upstanding neighborhood again. Was that neighborhood crying out for a series of meetings on the mark of the beast? Was that neighborhood crying for a courageous Adventist to move in and take charge and, uh, and help show the people that there can be a better way of life? You see, we pitched a tent the next month and preached the mark of the beast. Did we go too far? How did we get here? How did we get here? I think one thing to realize, how did this become such a central part of our evangelistic meetings? If you know the history, it may help you in your own decision processes as to what role this type of information should play in our outreach to the communities today. It just so happens, uh, the United States, uh, where our, our church largely began and where a lot of our traditions began, the United States in the uh, 1800s was basically a Protestant nation. All right, There were largely peoples of Northern European background. The immigrants and foreigners in America in the 1850s, 60s were Scandinavians and Germans and British. You see? So these were, these were peoples who were Protestant in their background and Protestants tended to be really down on carnivals and bars and all that kind of stuff. Starting around the 1880s and 1890s, immigration shifted from Northern Europe to Southern Europe. Now you had Spanish, Italians, Greeks, others, largely Roman Catholics. Roman Catholics were more relaxed about partying and alcohol and things like that. And if you're familiar with Lord of the Rings at all, the books and so on, Tolkien was a Roman Catholic. And so the hobbits, you know, they smoke their pipes and they drink their stuff, and it's the joy of life. Yes, that's a Roman Catholic view of the world. So Roman Catholics were moving in to the United States and were opening bars and carnivals and all of that, and the Protestant children were being sucked into some of these things, and what does the community say about it? They're horrified. America in the late 1880s and 1890s was a virulently anti-Catholic place. Why? Because they saw the immigration of Catholics as destroying the very fabric that made America great. You could go to the New York Times in the 1890s and you see Uncle Sam, you know, it's sort of our, the moniker of America, standing on the beach, sweeping back the ocean. And when you look out into the ocean in this cartoon, you see bobbing heads out there and it says, Catholics. Uncle Sam's trying to sweep back the ocean. You see, Protestant America was deathly afraid of a Catholic invasion. I didn't make those words up. Just, just talking history, a hundred years ago. Was scared to death of a Catholic invasion. You see, one of our evangelists had a brilliant idea. He says, you know, Protestants are so down on Catholics why don't we help them to realize that they're teaching the same doctrines that Catholics teach? If you're anti-Catholic, you had better move all the way to the true Protestant faith. And that was the fundamental basis for Adventist evangelism at that time, was saying, was reaching out to Protestant people who were worshiping on Sunday but were anti-Catholic and saying, well, if you want to be anti-Catholic, then you really better be anti-Catholic, if that's the way you want to be. You see, if you're not comfortable with that, why are you living and behaving the same way that they do? And it was a powerful evangelistic tool to move people who otherwise said Sabbath interesting but not interested, to suddenly saying Sabbath is a life and death issue. I've got to move here one way or the other. You see, because if I don't, I'll end up being a Catholic, which I don't think is the healthy approach today. So in the context of late 19th century America, this became central to our basic evangelistic structure. And if you've studied the history of evangelism through the 20th century, you realize that fundamental thing hasn't really changed in 100 years. Now, in my experience, things that don't change in 100 years sometimes tend to get 
a little bit out of date sometimes. So how we got here is an important aspect. And the question is, where to now? Are the basic teachings, is our concern as Adventists about some of the things that have been brought into Christian faith through the papacy down the centuries, is that concern misguided? No, it is not. These are matters of historical fact. The key issue today in New Zealand, the key issue today in New Zealand is, is New Zealand where the United States was in the 1880s and 1890s? Is that the most effective approach to reach New Zealanders today? I can't answer that question for you, but that is the fundamental question. One thing that it seems to me has changed, and I'm not coming here tonight to give you final answers. This is all part of discussion that's happening in the highest places of the church and throughout the world. But just reflecting on these things. One thing that has changed in today's world is that, as was the case with the United States back then, the United States was clearly a Christian nation. There was increasing division between the Catholic and Protestant side of that Christian nation, but it was a Christian nation. Today, the majority of people in the Western countries, including New Zealand, Australia, the majority of people today are neither Protestant nor Catholic. They are secular in their perspective. They are non-Christian in their outlook on the world. And you know what's a fascinating thing? In today's world, as was mentioned in the video at the beginning, when Adventists and Catholics are in a situation where they are facing the secular world, they tend to see each other as allies. I'll tell you just a little story. It was a major Catholic university in North America. Everybody in North America knows about this university because it has a very famous football team. And it just so happened that uh, I was visiting that university frequently uh, because of certain things uh, I needed to study in their library and uh, certain uh, there were some Adventists that were studying there uh, doing some uh, historical work and so forth so I had reason to visit on a fairly regular basis and there was a scholar there who's one of the five or six best in the world on the book of Revelation Roman Catholic lady very sweet lady and um, the fascinating thing was she pulled me aside one day. She says, I'm so glad that you come from time to time. She says, I really look forward to your visits. And I said, why? She says, the rest of the faculty here are secular. She says, they don't really hold strong convictions about prayer and, and, and relationship with Jesus and so on. She says, you do. She says, when I see you coming, I see someone I can pray with, someone I can talk to about faith and so forth. Now, that's a different world than the 1880s. Am I to say to her, no, I'm with the secularists, okay? You're the enemy. <laughs> you follow what I'm saying? All right. So as we approach the subject, we need to be listening. We need to be sensitive to the audience that we're speaking to, sensitive to how these things will play. By the way, same lady, one day... Uh, we were having lunch at the cafeteria there, and the only item on the menu uh, that I felt comfortable eating was a cheese sandwich. And so I got that. And we were sitting down having lunch together. Right in the middle of lunch, I was just taking a big bite on the cheese sandwich. She turned to me and says, what do you do with the harlot of Revelation 17 anyway? <laughs> and I choked on my cheese sandwich. <laughs> And then sent Nehemiah's prayer up to heaven for a little bit of guidance. Now, what would you say? Is that a time to get medieval with her? Well, I said what I felt that God led me to say. And I said, you know, the woman of Revelation 17 is out in the desert. And there's another woman in chapter 12, and she's out in the desert. And it seems like there's some kind of link between those two. And it tells me that the greatest enemies of the church, according to Revelation, will be inside the house rather than outside. You know what she said? 
She says, I believe that too. She says, I never got into that Roman Empire business, that all this stuff is about the Roman Empire. She says, I really think that the harlot is talking about Christians, fellow Christians that John is concerned about, that they are undermining the faith, and so on. And I resisted the temptation to say, you're not far from the kingdom of God. <laughs> but you see, I, as, as you look at relationships and things like that, it behooves us to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. I am not the one to in any way dictate how you do these things in New Zealand because I'm not the expert that is here. But those of you who are here on the ground, listen carefully to your communities. Study carefully what the needs are. And then when you get an opportunity to present the message, present it in the way that is most effective for New Zealand. A method that was designed and, and implemented in the United States a hundred years ago may be the best method for here today. It may be, but it may not be. And may God guide you and keep you as you wrestle to make Adventist identity the place where God wants it to be. And may it be the message that God will use to bring many people to Jesus Christ in this land. Would you stand with me for prayer? Lord, this is a very difficult message uh, because it, it may seem to some that I'm being critical of the church or critical of others, and that's not my purpose, Lord. It is my desire simply to see your work flourish and prosper in a country like New Zealand. And dear Lord, you've given us much information that is very, very vital to our survival at the end time. We must not look away from the truth as it is in Jesus. At the same time, Lord, give us the wisdom to know what to put first in a series and what to put last. Give us the wisdom to speak words that open hearts rather than shut them. And I pray above all that uh, your spirit would fill this tent and fill this conference with just that kind of joy in Jesus, that kind of wisdom in, pres in presentation of the gospel that uh, will bring about the great end-time remnant that we look forward to. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.